Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, David Kim. Yeah, it's right over there. Get it, it should be in the middle. Tell John to bring it over and put it in the middle. Okay. If I could grab everyone's attention one more time. If I could grab your attention for just a few minutes. We'd like to uh, recognize our special guest for the evening. Thank you very much with the glasses. I appreciate that. Seems like we have a big party going on over here. This is good. <laughs> this guy, that's Dick Pace and his crew from Riverside Yacht Club. Getting rowdy. OK, if I could grab everyone's attention. Thank you very much. So it's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to present our Patriot Award tonight to my friend and West Point classmate, General Eric Carrilla. Eric and his lovely wife, Mary Page, have served our country for over 27 years in uniform. In his current role, he advises the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the National Security Council and the White House on matters concerning special operations and counterterrorism. He spent virtually his entire career in the special operations units, where he's compiled an incredible service record. He's literally led combat units every single year from 2004 to 2014 overseas in combat, 10 years in a row during some portion of the year. When he came home last year, he was supposed to get a year-long stateside assignment to rest up a little bit, but ISIS flared up and Eric deployed about six weeks after he returned home from his last combat tour. He went right back to Iraq. Mary Page and their two daughters have endured more separation than almost any military family, almost any army family today. She's a very, very strong woman and she's also served our country admirably. Like all good infantrymen, Eric leads his men from the front. He's been shot four times in combat and has a titanium femur, courtesy of a close-range firefight with some Iraqi terrorists. It's an incredible story, and you can read about that in your program, but needless to say, Eric won that fight. Yeah. But the best tribute I can offer are some words from Admiral Bill McRaven, who's one of America's finest warriors and, as you remember, received our Patriot Award last year. Uh, Admiral McRaven had this to say about Eric. Eric is without a doubt the finest warrior I have ever met. He's relentless in pursuing the enemy. No one is more tactically astute or better understands the strategic nature of warfare. His leadership saved the lives of thousands of Iraqi and Afghan soldiers and civilians. They may never know whose decisions kept them alive, but I do. It was Eric Carrilla. But more importantly, I don't know anyone who cares more about his troops than the Big Eagle. I was with him on way too many occasions when we visited wounded soldiers in the combat hospital. The love he has for his soldiers was evidence in every handshake, in every word, and in every tear he shed for their sacrifice. Eric also spoke at countless memorial services. He was able to convey both the sense of devastating loss and the sense of incredible warrior pride in the sacrifice of a fallen soldier for their country. I guess I could sum it up in a few words. Eric Carrilla is the finest soldier I've ever known. Eric. Please accept our Patriot Awards as a symbol of our gratitude for your service and leadership to our nation and our people. Please join us on stage.
Sorry, Jack. Well, good evening, everybody. Dave, I thought you were actually going to say a bunch of bad things, so I was going to remind you that I make a living tracking down people in very hard to find places <laughs> and find out the sources of all your material tonight. So, so much for that comment. I was going to open up with a funny story tonight, but I was reminded yesterday of the incredible evil that exists in the world, and our thoughts and prayers go out to the families of those killed by terrorists in Paris. Our nation's oldest ally was attacked by ISIS terrorists, and over 100 were killed in cold blood, leaving behind most likely scores of children that no longer have a father or a mother to care for them. I can think of nothing nobler than the sacred duty to care for our children, and nothing, absolutely nothing, more noble than to care for the children of those who have died in defense of our nation. From the bottom of my heart, thank you, Dave and Cynthia, for what you and your entire team do for these children. I am truly honored to be standing here tonight, and I only accept this honor on behalf of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that I have served with. It was President Abraham Lincoln that stated that a nation that does not honor its heroes will not long endure. I'm often reminded that our American society places the wrong people on a pedestal. Society's heroes are someone that can catch a football for $24 million, or an actor that pretends to be someone else in a fictional television script, or even someone who can sing a song better than the next. Those aren't heroes. One need only look around at the service members and veterans that surround us today to find America's true heroes. You see, less than one half of 1% of Americans' current population, one half of 1%, are currently serving in the military in defense of our nation. It is a fraction of those who are in combat and a fraction of those that are at the tip of the spear. They serve not for glory, recognition, fanfare, or fame, but to a calling of duty. It was Winston Churchill who said it best. Never was so much owed by so many to so few. I would like to take the time to tell you a little bit about a few soldiers and a few sailors I had the privilege to serve with that represent this honor. Scott Smiley was a young second lieutenant and platoon leader at the top of his game in my battalion in Mosul in 2005. During a combat mission in April 2005, Scott noticed a vehicle and driver that seemed just a little out of place. When Scott raised his weapon at the driver, he exploded his car bomb that would leave Scott severely wounded and completely blind for the rest of his life. Scott would go on to have over a dozen surgeries and found himself becoming angry and depressed. How was I going to care for my wife, the woman that I love, if I couldn't even care for himself? It was his wonderful wife who would make him make that choice, and Tiffany said the choice was clear. She could let her mind go in a way and say we're ruined, we're not going to be able to do this anything, or she could go the other way and be his, be his biggest cheerleader. After extensive rehab, with an incredible support of his wife, Scott became the first blind active duty officer in the Army. He went on to earn an MBA from Duke University, commanded a basic training company at Fort Benning, Georgia, and is now the father of three wonderful boys. Scott was selected as the Army Soldier of the Year in 2007, and then he decided he wanted to do more. He began to take on challenges, climbed Mount Rainier, mastered surfing, and became the first blind person to ever complete the grueling Ironman triathlon that included a 2.2-mile swim, 112-mile bike, and a 26.2-mile marathon in over 100-degree weather at the Coeur d'Alene uh, recent um, Iron Man. Scott and his lovely wife, Tiffany. <laughs> Scott and his lovely wife, Tiffany, have become an inspiration to every blind person in America. Never was so much owed by so many to so few. On 3 October 2005, Sergeant Joe Kapicheski was a ranger in 3rd Ranger Battalion and attacked by a grenade, shattering Cap's right leg below the knee, damaging his right hip, and severing a nerve and artery in his right arm. Cap endured over 40 surgeries, but his right leg still wasn't healing as he had hoped. So in March 2007, Cap chose to have it amputated with one goal in mind, to return to the line and serve alongside his fellow Rangers. He knew he could not do that with a damaged leg. And one thing the Ranger Regiment does not do is lower its standards. Because Cap was wounded, he could continue to serve in the Ranger Regiment, but not in a combat front assault force role. To do that, Cap had to pass all the physical requirements 
the minimum requirements just to serve as a squad leader. Five miles in under 40 minutes, parachute with up to 100 pounds of combat equipment, fast rope from helicopters with combat gear, obstacle courses, rope climbs, road marches with 12 mi for 12 miles with over 100 pounds of gear, and the list goes on and on. One year after his surgery, Cap accomplished his goal. He was put back on the line as the squad leader in 3rd Ranger Battalion. He even ran his five-mile run in 34 minutes. That's right, on a prosthetic leg. On April 19, 2010, during his eighth combat deployment and fifth after losing his leg, Cap's patrol ran into an ambush outside a village on the Pakistan border. After a fellow ranger fell to wither an enemy fire shot through the belly, Cap and another soldier dragged him 75 yards to safety and administered first aid that saved him, that saved his life while Taliban raked their position with heavy machine gun fire. I remember talking to Cap when he came back off the helicopter, and he laughingly told me he was shot through his prosthetic leg, but he always kept a spare on his back. Think about that for a minute. Cap would go on to complete three triathlons and finish the New York City Marathon twice, but always found time to visit wounded warriors in Walter Reed and Brook Army Medical Center, those that were also amputees. Cap has now completed his 11th combat deployment, received two awards for valor, and three Purple Hearts. Don't tell me this generation is soft. Never was so much owed by so many to so few. Success on hostage rescue operations rely on speed, surprise, and aggressive action, trading personal security for speed of action, risking your life to save others. I purposely kept the names of those involved out of this speech based on their unit, but it's important to tell the story to understand these are the type of Americans I've had the privilege to serve beside in command. In December 2012, a task force, I was task force commander in Afghanistan, a US doctor, Dr. Dilip Joseph, who had been doing humanitarian assistance in remote villages in Afghanistan was taken hostage by Taliban terrorists. The Taliban intended to transport him to Afghan over the Afghanistan-Pakistan border and turn him to Taliban leadership in Pakistan who undoubtedly would tended to use him as a lever against the United States or worse. Through a series of intelligence means, we were able to identify the location where the captors were hiding Dr. Joseph. We also learned that the Taliban intended to move him very early the next morning and had very little time to act. So that night on 8 December 2012, the same night Army and Navy were playing a football game, the rest of America was oblivious to what was occurring 7,000 miles away. As they did almost every night in those years, the Joint Special Operations Team prepared and launched in a combat operation against the enemy. However, this was anything but a normal operation. The infiltration would take place close to the valley, which at the scene of the greatest U.S. loss of life in a single combat incident just a year before. The steel troop would cross over 10,000 foot ridge line that was considered nearly impassable during the day. Yet this steel troop would do it wearing night vision to goggles with a clock ticking against them. The final mile was treacherous requiring each assault to negotiate the steep drop, sometimes using ropes while maintaining stealth and security. As the rescue force closed the final distance and was only 25 meters away from the, an armed guard came out of the building to smoke a cigarette and spotted the assault force as it was nearly 100% illumination that night and he immediately ran back inside. The forward most assaulter, Nick, raced toward the door to make entry. Six layers of blankets securely fastened to sealing the walls of the Afghan door. While one assaulter tried to rip down the blankets, Nick, the first seal, pushed his way through the door and was immediately engaged by withering enemy AK-47 fire. Fully aware of the hostile threat inside the room that was now shooting, the rest of the team boldly entered the room behind Nick, their teammate, who now was mortally wounded and laying on the ground, and they engaged the guard with the AK-47. As this occurred, another adult male darted toward the corner of the room but could not be distinguished as friend or foe. The number two seal in the room dropped his long gun and pounced on the unknown male thinking it was possibly Dr. Joseph to seize control of the struggling male. While wrestling with him, the seal maintained control of the unknown male with one hand, adjusted the focus of his night vision goggles with the other, and once his night vision goggles were focused to the person within his grasp, he realized that the male was not Dr. Joseph, so he drew his pistol and engaged him at point blank range, killing the terrorist. By now, other team members had entered the room and were calling Dr. Joseph to identify himself. The same number two SEAL heard an unknown voice speak English from his right side and immediately leapt across the room and selflessly flung his body on top of the American hostage, shielding him from the continued rounds being fired in the room. Almost simultaneously, the same assaulter identified another additional enemy directly behind the doctor. While covering the hostage with his body, he was able to pin the enemy com uh, combatant against the wall with his hand around the enemy's throat. Think about that for a minute. You are covering the hostage to make sure you protect him from harm, 
the entire purpose of your mission, the whole reason you are there, and you are holding a terrorist by the throat with no other means to take action, and you have the faith, trust, and confidence in your teammates that they will do harm to those that would harm you. He was unable to use his pistol to reach for it, would uncover the doctor from protection from the bullets flying in the room. However, he was able to restrain the terrorist enough to enable his teammates to fire precision shots, killing the final threat in the room. Where do we find men such as these? Never was so much owed by so many to so few. I could go on and on and tell you about literally hundreds of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines such as these and their incredible families. Perhaps Mark Twain said it best when he described people such as these. Unconsciously, we all have a standard by which we measure others. And if we examine closely, we find that this standard is a very simple one, and it is this. We admire them, we envy them for great qualities we often lack ourselves. Our heroes are people who do things which we recognize with regret and sometimes with a secret shame that we cannot do. When people tell me this millennial generation or Generation X isn't tough enough, can't hack it, or doesn't know about sacrifice, they don't know the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that I know. Our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines represent the best in America. Warriors willing to go where others would not and do things that others think unthinkable. They have a physical and mental scars of 14 years of continuous combat. They step out in the dark and unknown for the safety and well-being of others with the weight of the world on their shoulders. In the Bible in Isaiah 6, 8, we read, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. When others would not go, our veterans raised their hand and said, Here am I, send me. May God bless the Children of Fallout Patriots Foundation. May God bless our military, and may God bless America. Thank you. Sorry, Jack, I'm not sure where you're at. Here. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the main course and the program will resume shortly. <laughs> 